Shabbat Shalom. Let's begin with the blessing for studying Torah. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kitshanu B'Mitzvotah V'Tzivanu La'asok B'Divrei Torah. Blessed are you Adonai our God, ruler of the universe, who hallows us with mitzvot and commands us to busy ourselves in the words of Torah. And we're going to look at some commentary on the end of Deuteronomy 25, the end of Parshat Kititze. So this is about making a loan to somebody. And this is by Rabbi Professor Mark Saperstein, the brother of Rabbi David Saperstein, who for 35 years was the head of the Religious Action Center of Reformed Judaism when a debtor does not repay. When you make a loan of any sort to your compatriot, you must not enter the house to seize the pledge. You must remain outside while the person to whom you made the loan brings the pledge out to you. As in many legal systems, including our own, loans made under Jewish law frequently required the borrower to designate an item of value as security. Remember that when Judah slept with his daughter-in-law Tamar without recognizing her. Before she slept with him, she asked him to give her a pledge because he didn't have any cash on hand. So he gave her his rope and his staff. The accepted practice was that the designated security could remain in the possession of the borrower during the term of the loan. If the money owed was not repaid upon the designated date for repayment, the creditor had the right to take possession of the security. Frequently, the creditor would hold onto it for another fixed period to give the borrower the opportunity for repayment and restoration of the item. Biblical law asserts that the creditor has no right to enter the borrower's home in order to seize the pledge that he has the right to possess. The debtor himself must produce it. So, of course, this is very different from cops, for example, coming into someone's home without knocking and ramming the door in and then shooting the wrong person. The problem is obvious. What if the borrower refuses to produce the security pledge? What if he claims that he has lost or sold it or used it for another loan and that it has already been taken and he has nothing of value to give over to the creditor? The biblical law explicitly prohibits the creditor from entering the house to investigate but may a neutral emissary of the court enter the borrower's domain. The law of the Talmud clarifies this ambiguity by stating, no, even the emissary of the court must remain outside. If the creditor believes that the borrower is lying and that he does indeed have property of value in his house or concealed somewhere else, the creditor has the burden of proof in accordance with the general principle, hamotzi mechavero alav hara aya. The burden of proof lies with the person who seeks to remove property from the possession of his neighbor. Apparently, this legislation protected the rights of the borrower to such an extent that the result was a credit squeeze. Potential borrowers who needed loans were simply unable to find people willing to lend under these circumstances. And of course, the loan would be without interest. Now, this is similar to the problem that every seven years, debts are supposed to be forgiven. And so therefore, it's very hard to find anyone who's going to lend to you, especially towards the seventh year, and which is why Rabbi Hillel uh, issued the prosbol, which gave the court the right to basically get the money. Biblical and rabbinic legislation intended to help the borrower seem to have the opposite effect. Therefore, in order to free up the credit market, the Geonim, heads of biblical, I mean, I'm sorry, heads of Babylonian academies in the post-Talmudic age enacted new legislation. The debtor who does not repay on time and claims he no longer has a security pledge is to be subjected to a strict oath that he has no property concealed. And if he is seen holding any property of value, the burden of proof shifts to the debtor who must prove that this property does not belong to him. The great legal scholar Moses Maimonides, whose code of Jewish law records this fascinating post-Talmudic development in response to changing economic circumstances, continues to write, 
Even now, after the above regulation has been enacted, neither the creditor nor the court's representative may enter the debtor's house for the purpose of enforcing distraint, since the enactment was not intended to abolish an essential rule of law. The debtor himself must bring out his movables and say, this is what I have. As we saw with the punishment of 40 lashes for someone who broke the law in some way or another, it's only 40 and sometimes up to 39 lashes because we want to preserve the dignity of the person who committed a crime. And here, we also want to preserve a person's dignity. After fully recording the new legislation of the Geonim, Maimonides continues to present his own clarification. This rigorous oath should not be imposed by a judge upon debtor who is known to be so pious that he would refuse to swear such an oath, lest he might have forgiven, uh, forgotten an asset from years ago, nor should it be imposed upon a debtor who is known to be so dishonest that he would readily swear to something he knows to be untrue. Maimonides' conclusion leaves considerable discretion to the judge. Everything the judge does in these matters with the intention of pursuing justice only, and not of tampering with the law to the detriment of one of the litigants, he is permitted to do, and he will receive heavenly reward for it. And of course, giving all this discretion to a judge is possibly problematic. It's very hard to judge other human beings as to whether or not they are pious or liable to be lying. And judges also have political biases and other kinds of biases that might uh, not render them the most objective people to decide whether someone is telling the truth. But some later authorities wrote that this final statement applies only in an environment where the judges are honest and reliable, not if the judges themselves are under suspicion. Again, it's very hard to find a judge that is thoroughly and totally objective. Here we have an example that beautifully illustrates the principles of progressive Judaism. Despite the claims of fundamentalists, Jewish law has not remained static and unchanging from the revelation at Mount Sinai to the present. It has developed dynamically and adapted in accordance with the wisdom of the sages and the medieval authorities in response to their perception of the needs of their times. Yet there are limits to such changes. Basic fundamental principles rooted in the Torah must still be honored. Both the creditor and the emissary of the court must still remain outside the debtor's home. This may well be the source of the familiar principle in British law that a man's home is his castle. The statement has been used by right-wing thinkers to defend some rather unappealing conclusions that a man has a right within his home to beat his wife and his children without any interference from the legal authorities. But the biblical source show, sources show that a very different meaning was intended. A defense of the dignity of even the most humble human being faced potentially with humiliating circumstances. As formulated by William Pitt the Elder, the poorest man may in his cottage bid defiance to all the forces of the crown. It, the cottage, may be frail, its roof may shake, the wind may blow through it, the storm may enter, the rain may enter, but the king of England may not enter unless invited. And certainly, neither can the President of the United States or the creditor seeking repayment. And as Jason mentioned in a new book by Malcolm Gladwell, we are predisposed to trust people, but I would venture to say that we trust people who are within our own communities and we don't tend to trust people who are outside our communities. So that leaves us open to the possibility of making biased judgments. Okay, record. Um, you know, a jury, at least you're dealing with the judgment of a larger group of people and you have the ability for there to be some outliers who may or may not, you know, be the one person making the judgment but a group is more likely to be able to form a better collective judgment in theory than one person acting alone, I would That's think. That's a theory. But then you get, like, speaking of O.J. Simpson, right? Um, you, you have a jury that is also influenced by events. And after Rodney King, 
I think part of why O.J. Simpson was let go was, you know, hey, you know what? You didn't punish the four white cops who, you know, beat up on Rodney King. We're not going to convict a black person. <clears throat> so there's so many things that influence people's judgment, right? Um, so, you know, you can have all the beautiful laws you want, but they have to be implemented by us, right? <clears throat> and, okay, Felice, you're... Wait, you're, uh, you're muted. As I said, this is my slogan for 2020. You're muted. <laughs> okay. There you go. Okay. Right, thank you. Um, uh, uh, the, the idea, uh, a couple of things come to my mind that hasn't been discussed and eloquently expressed by Jane and Jason um, is perjury in Reformed Ju uh, Judaism. And also, um, who you are, personality-wise, when uh, I think it was Jason said something, I'm shaking my head negatively. I don't believe everything, uh, you know, even family and people that I know, um, that I love, uh, let alone strangers, but if your personality, I guess it's personality, uh, and you're analytical and gone into the sciences, you're gonna question constantly, at least in the I statements, at least I do, and not accept things as are. And, and um, did, you know, how did judges, one judge come to be in Judaism as opposed to a jury system. Um, th those are some thoughts that come to my mind. Well, I, I, think that, you know, I think they're talking about very early days of how uh, things were adjudicated. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, I mean, usually you know, a, Beit, a Beit Dean has three judges, right? So that already theoretically helps Okay, that makes more sense yeah. than, than relying on one person's right. judgment. Right. Um, I think and that then, jury system came from uh, medieval England. Probably, yeah. Yeah, because I mean, it was, uh, you, you always had a judge, uh, but it was, um, <laughs> it was actually uh, a way of politically, um, bringing the Anglo-Saxon population into a uh, French Norman institution. Uh, and it was, it was actually a way of co-opting the Concord, if you want to really want to know the history of it. <laughs> okay. uh, so much for great, great uh, lofty ideals. <laughs> Okay, so um, we're going to move on to Amalek. Uh, we did read about that last week. If you remember, we're told that we must never forget to blot out Amalek's name, which is slightly contradictory, right? Remember to blot out. <laughs> so You should forget the name. Then you'll forget the name. <laughs> it's completely contradictory. And um, <clears throat> remember, Amalek is the, you know, people who gave uh, the Israelites a hard time as they went through the desert and attacked them from behind. And, you know, and then Amalek represents all the bad people, you know, Hitler and Saddam Hussein, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm going to share the, okay, now it's disappeared, of course. This is not what I want to share. Wait a second. Oh, okay, wait a sec. Open. Here it is, but it's not the part I want to look at. You see Kititse up there? Yes? No. Okay. I have to do new share. There it is. Okay. Go down to the bottom. Okay. Um, Doug, you want to read? Who is Amalek? And it, it gives you the quote from the... Yeah, let me just move the pictures of all of you wonderful people over to the side. 
<laughs> there we go. All right. Remember what Amalek did to you on your journey after you left Egypt. So, undeterred. Under How undeterred? There we go. Uh, by fear, he surprised you on the march when you were famished and weary and cut down all the stragglers in your rear. Therefore, when the Lord your God grants you safety from all your enemies around you in that land that the Lord your God is giving you as a hereditary portion, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget. So by the way, <clears throat> attacking from the rear is particularly horrible because the people in the rear are the people who are stragglers. So they're the ones who are weaker, um, probably older, and so you're, you're attacking the most vulnerable. So that's particularly heinous. All right, thank you. At the end of a dizzying list of mitzvot in this week's parasha, we encounter the commandment to remember what Amalek did to us and to blot out the memory of Amalek forever. So let's remember, Amalek was a legendary nation of nomads that became the prototypical arch enemy of the Jews. Every biblical encounter between Israel and Amalek is marked by hostility. The Amalekites uh, first appear in Exodus. Um, sadist oh, hold on a second. There we go. Sadistically attacking the weak stragglers at the rear of the camp, just after the Israelite slaves had gone free from Egypt. In Genesis, where the mythic origins of nations are told, Amalek first surfaces. In Genesis, a battlefield is called the Plains of Amalek, even though, as the Midrash, Bereshit Rabbah, points out, the man Amalek hasn't even been born yet. Amalek himself appears in Genesis, a grandson of Esau, and the forerunner of the 12 tribes of Adam, who dwell in the Negev and the Sina in, in, and Sinai regions. However, the Torah tells us very little about the Amalekites. What motivates them? Who are their gods? What language do they speak? Biblical scholars have pointed out that the Amalekites are not attested in any ancient sources outside the Bible. There is no archaeological record that confirms the existence of the Amalekites anywhere with any certainty. It's pretty sneaky of the Torah to command us to remember people who possibly. <laughs> Amalek seems to be more myth than man, a primeval primeval enemy that evokes terror in the Jewish heart. In Numbers 13, when the spies, when the spies who scouted out the land of Israel decide to send fear into the hearts of their countrymen, they report Amalek dwells there in the Negev. Eventually, Amalek assumed mythical status in the Jewish consciousness. Amalek is associated with perennial, so it seems, genocidal anti-Semites who would annihilate the Jewish people. Just as the Passover Haggadah reminds us that in every generation as enemy has risen up to destroy us, the name Amalek has become synonymous with an evil that appears in every age. In this constant battle of good versus evil, the Torah advocates that when the Jewish people arrive in their homeland and build up their nation to a place of safety and security, they should turn their attention to the legacy of Amalek and blot out its memory. It is curious the Torah should resort to the euphemisms here rather than more bluntly saying, kill all the Amalekites. The Torah does not command us to kill the Amalekites, whoever they were, without whitewashing what is certainly a violent text. We can point to some mitigating commentaries throughout history. Maimonides, for instance, insists that in the war against Amalek, just like, just like other wars in the Torah, the enemy should still be offered terms of peaceful surrender before engagement. In the Jewish mystical tradition, for, the, for instance, in the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov, Amalek is the arrogance within each of us that always leaves destruction in its wake. It is this Amalek with whom God is always at war throughout the ages. Amalek is the embodiment of evil, and God knows the Jewish people have encountered Amalek head on in our history. So Baal Shem Tov is a Hasidic master, mystical, just so you know who he is. It is hard to argue that Hitler, for instance, was not the 20th century embodiment of Amalek. It is a nuclear Iran with missiles pointed at Tel Aviv, a modern day Amalek? Perhaps so, but what about the Palestinians? There is a dilemma here. It is very dangerous to label our very real adversaries as Amalek. Amalek cannot be reasoned with. Conflicts with Amalek cannot be resolved justly through negotiation. The only choice with Amalek is to contain its evil until it's ultimately vanquished. To call an enemy Amalek means to unleash a certain absolutism that cannot easily be reined in afterwards and that it is a dangerous prospect. 
author Jos Klein Halavi sums up brilliantly our contemporary dilemma about Amalek, especially in the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Halavi argues that the Jewish people today wrestle with two voices from our past, two biblical commands to remember. On one hand, we are told to remember Amalek, which Halavi explains means don't be naive. There are people out there who want to do us real harm. On the other hand, we're also commanded to remember that we were strangers in the land of Egypt, which he suggests means don't be cruel. By knowing what it means to be a stranger, we are commanded to protect and defend the rights of, minor of any minority who lives among us. Both acts of remembering are true. Alavi reminds us, but, we also, but he also argues that different segments in our community choose to remember one commandment and rarely the, or the other, rarely both. The right wing tends to emphasize, remember Amalek by placing security concerns above all else, including human rights. The left is inclined to stress, remember you were strangers by placing social justice for others, even ahead of Jewish survival. He was right. One reason the Palestinian issue is so wrenching for Jews, Halavi writes, is that it is the point on which the two commands of our history converge. The stranger in our midst is represented by a national movement that wants to pursue us. It is a sober reality for us, sorry, it is a sober reality for today's Zionists, each of us called to perform both acts of remembering. We know that Amalek indeed walks amok, ready to harm us if we are not on our guard but not every adversary wants to eradicate the Jewish people. Some of our adversaries have narratives to which we must learn and injustices for which must be corrected if we hope to have any sort of peaceful future for ourselves and our children. Our conflicts demand self-reflection, the strength and wisdom to identify where Amalek dwells today and where he doesn't. Thank you. So I, I think Halevi's point about this is, is really interesting and this idea that we have to be on our guard because we know what's happened in, you know, to Jews throughout history, to Israel. On the other hand, we want to be sensitive to other people. And, and it does really converge in the issue of the Palestinians because on the one hand, we want to say, yes, Palestinians have a right to self-determination just like all people. On the other hand, <clears throat> uh, there are many Palestinians who don't even think the state of Israel should exist. Um, and as you may or may not know, when the UN partitioned the land in 48, um, the Arab countries surrounding Israel refused to accept that. And actually, each one of the countries took a piece of the land that was supposed to become a Palestinian state. So, <clears throat> it, it, you know, I, I do believe we should be out of the West Bank, but I, I, I also understand how treacherous that could be. And so it's really, you know, really complicated. And as, you know, the, the commentator says, you don't want to label people as Amalek because then it's all or nothing. It's like, you know, you destroy them, you don't negotiate, you don't reach, reach compromise. But it is important to remember that there are enemies out there. It's sort of like what you were saying, Felice, about not trusting everybody, right? You have to use your judgment. <clears throat> Any thoughts about Amalek or Palestinians? Well, I know it's a real problem. And just on a personal note, when I was teaching at Crafton, uh, almost towards the end of my teaching career there, I had three Arab students, females in my class. And I was very um, nonplussed when the three of them walked in, as was the rest of the class. And uh, one of them dropped out, but the other two who were sisters-in-law stayed. And uh, they were a real asset to the class, uh, especially one of them. Her name was Walla Tabel. And I really got to like her and admire her and just listening to her perspective as an outsider on American history, you know, was fascinating. So we're chatting across the classroom uh, one day. I was teaching immigration. And I casually said, because I assumed that they were like Jordanian or something, you know, something acceptable. <laughs> 
And um, I we're said, gonna be taken off of YouTube. Wala. I said, so Walla, where is your family from? And she said, Palestine. And the class told me that my jaw literally dropped onto the floor because I liked this woman so much. And I went, oh. <laughs> well, was there something wrong with her being from Palestine? Uh, yeah, I mean, she's Palestinian, okay. you know, and at that point, I was hardwired, all Palestinians are bad. So it was just like this incredible moment of recognition of, of my own prejudices and how I had absorbed them without really thinking about it at all. Well, that's very uh, brave of you to admit that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. the class was just, you should have seen your face when she said she was a Palestinian way back. <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah. And yet we agreed on so many things. It was well, you know, I'm sure if you talked about Israel, you wouldn't have agreed on Israel. But, um, you know, you yeah. can understand if you, I yeah. mean, I'm not saying one way or the other, but if you had a home in some someplace that's now Israel and you lost it because Israel was uh, created, you wouldn't be too happy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and even if you weren't there, if you were on the other side, you know, in the, in the uh, West Bank, would you be happy to know that uh, you still don't have a state after all these years? And I mean, I'm not saying it's not a two-sided thing, but uh, and now they're, you know, Israel's talking about annexing a lot of the West Bank. Mm -hmm. So. I don't think that's good news. No. <laughs> Jason, did you, you? Well, I keep coming back to our discussion from last night and I don't know if it's drawing too much of a, um, of, of a line, but I feel like maybe the systemic racism in this country is kind of our Amalek. You know, it's this thing that we have to confront and it's this thing that we have to remember and and we can't but i'm struggling with this idea of whose history are we believing because not everyone shares the same perspective or belief in the same facts which is always a challenge and it's very hard to move forward if you can't agree on where you were so you know where you're going from and i feel like we're actually drifting farther and farther away from shared facts which makes anything that we want to move forward on even harder as a society, regardless of what it is. And that's where I feel like we're, <laughs> this just tells me that we are inevitably going to be confronted with these things in all of our societies and throughout, because people just are difficult and are inclined to wage wars and are inclined to try to wipe people out who aren't like them. And that we don't have the luxury of getting away from our innate human worstness, I guess. I, I think that say. is the Baal Shem Tov's idea. Yeah, the Baal Shem Tov's idea is that Amalek is within us, right? I think that's an important point. And it's, it, I was talking with a, a really good friend of mine. We traveled around Turkey together about five years ago. And she's originally, she now lives in New England, but she's originally from the South. Um, and, uh, and she says that she has a really interesting situation now because she's from the South. And um, her partner is originally from the South as well. And her family who's in, who's in the South will respond back because she's a lesbian whose partner is African-American and their representation of what the Confederate flag means. And this was, she posted this on Facebook. I found it to be fascinating. It's a conversation basically, the summation of a conversation with friends in the South of something, a symbol, a sim a, just a symbol, the Confederate flag, and what it means for her family that she grew up with, and as she put, even with the values that were, that were and, the, and the streams of, of, of thought that went through her family, and what it means to her now, and what it means to her partner now, and as her partner felt she had to escape the South, both being African American and also being gay, and what that means and how that has represented through. And her statement, and it comes very much into this, is these are deep elements within our own cultural fabric that tear us apart, not on any topic. You can bring up any topic you, you want to bring up, and it can go ahead and bring about this visceral reaction to it. And she put up something as simple as the map, the world map, 
and we all know that the world map and its projection is off. So when you look at it, often you'll see maps with the United States smack dab in the middle, and it looks ginormous. And um, some of the original maps were produced by the Catholic Church. It just so happened to represent, in the largest form, the white Catholic or white Christian nations, therefore making Africa, one of the largest continents, look extremely small. And she was mentioning how as you go through life and you do something as basic and simple as look up at a map that's on the wall and how that represents us as a people, how that represents the world, how it projects others as being above others in the world. And then you look at symbols like the Confederate flag and how important in the South it was to go to a Confederate cemetery and, and, war, and, and uh, honor the Confederate soldiers. And she said, now she looks at it and goes, how was it that I as a child went to these? And we discussed this in school and the importance of the Confederacy and the ideals of the Confederacy, which are the very things that brought people down that she now fights. And she's a strong activist in New England and the various things that she fights for and the various protests that she's in. And she says, there are two very simple symbols that people see all the time, the Confederate flag and what it might mean for some in the South and what it might mean for others in the South and what pulls you between those two is this deep component inside of us. And it just really brings back this conversation we're having. Yeah, and, and last night when we were talking about race, um, somebody brought up, well, the reason that more African-Americans are in prison is because they commit more crimes. So, you know, you heard that, Jason, right? Um, now, I mean, so maybe we should look so, at the laws and how they're enforced unequally. Hey, hey that is an idea. Yeah, exactly. There, there's so many responses to that. But, you know, I, I, I did I tell you the story before? If I did, stop me. When I was at PBS and they had bought this film called Bronx Detectives, I told you about that, right? Yeah. So for most people, you know, everyone pretty much was white except for one or two people in the uh, on the programming staff. Yeah, the, the detectives are going and doing their jobs. But for the African-American person, this was emphasizing the stereotype, you know. And so why, you know, emphasize it and, and, and underline it and make it into something that everyone accepts as, as the reality, period. So, yeah, I, I think the Amalek within, within us is really uh, important uh, that it's it's not just out there. There is out there, but there's also in here. And it is part of who we are as human beings, unfortunately. You know, and we do need to confront the, there's a great book, I think I've mentioned it before, called Learning from the Germans. And it's by a woman who's from the South, who talks about, her name is Sue something on my shelf. Um, she talks about the fact that Germany has confronted its past, mm -hmm. and we have not. And, you know, how much of a difference it makes, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's not as though Germany is now perfect, but we certainly have not confronted our past at all. Anyhow, Jane, did you want to say something? Yeah, because I have real conflicts on this as a historian. I mean, all these Confederate statues are coming down. So to me, this is simply part of our history and you have to deal with the history. And if you take the statue down, aren't you evading dealing with the history? Because I don't think that just because a statue has been toppled uh, and some forts are going to be renamed, I don't think that stops this inherent racism that we have. And it's because of the way we self-identify, we always identify. I mean, this goes back so so far into the human experience because we identify by saying, well, at least I'm not like him, you know? And even the poorest white before the Civil War would identify with white slave owners who had 50,000 times more income than they did. And it was all, it was based on race. It was based on the color of your skin. Yeah. So as a historian, I guess I'm kind of an idealist. Um, but um, um, I really don't, don't see how, I, I see this as a politically correct moment. 
So um, Teresa says taking down the statues doesn't have to end racism. It just has to stop being a constant reminder to black people passing by on their way to work, et cetera. Because a lot of these statues were put up way after the Civil War as a way to say, mm -hmm. hey, by the way, just because you know, you're not slaves anymore doesn't mean that uh, white supremacy is gone. It was sort of a reminder to black people that, you know, watch out, I think. And then um, Jason mentions John Oliver from a couple of years ago on the Confederacy, and he gives a link to it. Um, so, you know, John Oliver actually does amazing, really investigative work. He, you know, he does it with irony and whatever, but he does serious, serious work. And okay, so you know what? We're, it just as I'm it points out in that video, some of these statues were put up when we have color film of the ceremony. You know, like these were in the 70s. You know, these were not yeah. recent, these were not old things that were put up in the 1880s, mm -hmm. right? This was done, like you say, to still remind people that this is what the society they want to be should still right. be. And it's not at all, and in, in, it's, it's intentionally done to keep people reminded of that right. history in right. a negative way, yeah. Okay, so I think we're gonna go on. Oh, did you wanna say something, Alejandra? I was just gonna say that, you know, the argument that like, well, everyone did something bad and you know, whatever, it's fine. I laugh because I'm like, you can't imagine you making a statue to a black person. Like, it's just, it's downfounding to me. They're like, well, no one at that time didn't know. And I'm like, you could also make a statue about somebody else. Um, and that's always very shocking that, that incredible blindside is always there. And also a statue kind of glorifies somebody, right? You yes. know, somebody that we look up to, you name, you name a fort after someone as an honor, right? Yep. So there are other ways, I think, to confront our history, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's, let's, um, okay. Uh, all right. I lost my, Okay, I gotta find the uh, Deuteronomy again. I got lost. Are we going to Kitabo? Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, good. Here we are. Okay, so. Rabbi? Yeah. Rabbi? Yes? Uh, I just wanted to uh, add a comment that we're talking about groups of people um, societally rather than individually. And Jane brought up a good point, and I've learned a lot by from you and um, and Carol Lee Jasmine uh, in talking, um, and certainly as a, a counselor at CSU Long Beach at one time, uh, had to deal with uh, sensitivity training and so on. Not that I. Uh, felt that I was prejudiced, but it, it was very in vogue in the late 80s and 90s in student services at the college level. Anyway, my point being is that we're talking about society and groups of people, Palestinians and Jews and so on. And one thing, Carol Lee, um, and you've expressed this too, um, and Jane brought this to mind too, is to deal with individuals, that um, a lot of this is um, group racism, um, that if we know these people, if we know individual Blacks, if we know individuals and talk with them, um, that we purge any um, erroneous, racism that we may have, and there's a lot of segregation, uh, racism in each of us, prejudices um, that we're probably unaware of. And uh, one thing Carol Lee said, and to wind this up, is uh, when I was working with uh, African uh, refugees through Glocally Connected, she, Carol Lee says, do they know you're Jewish? Tell them that, and whenever I was asked to say something in front of them, be it at a, an event that their husbands were also attending, I would always introduce 
my remarks by saying, I was referred to Glocally Connected through Rabbi Singer, um, and that I am Jewish. And you know, this opened up even more channels of conversation. And as Jane said, she realized commonalities with the student. And when I counsel students as a career counselor, but there's a lot of emotion that goes into this, people from, and I remember one student, uh, Jane and others, who was because of the, he was a, a Pakistani or Indian, I can't remember, but um, he wasn't Christian and he was dark skinned. And at an airport after 9-11, he was stopped. He was a, a brilliant pre-med student and he was strip searched and he confided in me his anger that they didn't know him as an individual who he was. So, you know, if we know each other as individuals, and I'm now wonderfully um, embracing my neighbors uh, across the street, a black family next door to me are um, uh, Americans that are of Mexican American heritage. So, you know, embrace individuals. Yeah, I agree with you uh, that, that you get you have to know people on the other hand sometimes what happens is people will still be prejudiced against a group saying well i know one person and that's the exception kind of thing and we don't want that to happen either so but i i agree with you you have to get to know people when you're you know if you're if you live in a segregated area and you never meet other people then obviously it's much easier to have all sorts of terrible ideas about them Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to share the next. Um, here we are. Okay. So does somebody want to read? We're just going to read a little bit of this. I'll read, but if it's okay, if I read from, from your book, that's fine. Okay, because I can't see this. Okay. That's okay. Okay. Uh, Kitavo, when you enter the land that the Lord your God is giving you as a heritage, and you possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of every first fruit of the soil which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Put it in a basket and go to the place where the Lord your God will choose to establish his name. You shall go to the priest in charge at that time and say to him, I acknowledge this day before the Lord your God that I have entered the land that the Lord swore to our fathers to assign us. The priest shall take the basket from your hand and set it down in front of the altar of the Lord your God. You shall then recite as follows before the Lord your God. My father was a fugitive Aramean. He went down to Egypt with meager numbers and sojourned there. And there he became a great and very populous nation. The Egyptians dealt harshly with us and opp oppressed us. They imposed heavy labor upon us. We cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our plea and saw our plight, our misery, and our oppression. The Lord freed us from Egypt by a mighty hand by an outstretched arm and awesome power, and by signs and portents. He brought us to this land and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Wherefore, I now bring the first fruits of the soil, which you, O oh Lord, have given me. Okay. Uh, why don't you just read that the last couple of lines there? You shall leave the basket. Okay. You shall yeah. leave the basket before the Lord your God and bow low before the Lord your God, and you shall enjoy, together with the Levite and the stranger in your midst, all the bounty that the Lord your God has bestowed upon you and your household. Thank you. Okay. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Very. <laughs> Where have you heard this? Well, the first part of Kitavo is very uh, reminiscent of the way uh, God talks to Abraham. Go, go to the land which I will show you, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. 
Uh, that part is very, very familiar. Uh, and basically, he's retelling the story of Exodus. He's using right. phrases straight out of Exodus. Right. So when do we say my father was a wandering Aramean? Passover? Exactly. That's what Lynn was saying, I think, right? Oh, I was trying to read yeah, your lips. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's what we say at Passover, right? Of course, there's some dispute as to what the wandering word is. Was it a fugitive or whatever? So we've got some commentary mm -hmm. from Rabbi Jonathan Blake. Oh. Jonathan, move over. Okay. okay. See Jonathan Blake? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, good. Um, so my father was a fugitive Aramean, etc. This first constitutes the kernel of the Passover Haggadah. When we tell our freedom story, we start here. It comes from our weekly Torah portion, Kitavo, which means when you enter. Once the Israelites arrive in the promised land, settle it and cultivate it, they must present a basket of choice produce to the priest. They are told to recite a formula, a compact narrative of the Israelite experience from nomadism to bondage to deliverance to inheritance. That is... That formula begins with the invocation, my father was a fugitive Aramean, or so it is often translated. Arami Oved Avi, the Hebrew reads the words Arami, Aramean, meaning a person from the territory of Aram in modern day Syria, and Avi, my father, are easily translated. But the meaning of Oved is ambiguous here. Oved, from the root Aleph Vet Dalid, can mean to lose, but it can also mean to perish or destroy. In the context of our portion, it might mean to be lost, to go astray, or as the JPS translation has it, to be a fugitive. But Jewish tradition should suggest other possible renderings. A comparison of different translations of the Haggadah proves this. The open door, a Passover Haggadah, which is edited by Sue Levy Elwell, says, my ancestors, wandering Arameans, went down to Egypt and sojourned there, few in number. Adding this explanatory note, we are descendants of wanderers in the region known as Aram. Abram and Sarai left their home to follow God to an unknown land. The open door identifies the fugitive or wandering Arameans with our ancestors, Abram and Sarai. That is to say, the patriarchs and matriarchs of the Jewish people. That's what you were talking about before, Jane. Pioneers who left home to answer God's call. On the other hand, the Sonsino Koran Haggadah says an Aramean sought to destroy my father, and he went down to Mitzrayim, to Egypt. In contradistinction to our first example, the Aramean here is an enemy of our people. An Aramean sought to destroy my father. The traditional Haggadah identifies this enemy as Laban, the Aramean, who denied Jacob his betrothal to Rachel, kept him in indentured servitude for years, and pursued him across the border when Jacob tried to flee. Thus does tradition present us with a second version of the Arami Oved, not a wandering Jew, but a foreigner bent on destroying our people. We are left with two divergent understandings of the same three Hebrew words. One translation portrays our people as intrepid pioneers, path seekers who left their home, Aram, setting out on a journey of discovery prompted by God's call to Abram, Lech Lecha, go forth. The other translation makes us vulnerable to enemies out to destroy us the way Laban hunted down Jacob. How we choose to translate our verse speaks volumes about our fundamental conception of Jewish history and Jewish identity. It's a little bit like what we were saying about Amalek. We have to be careful, but we also have to remember that we were slaves in Egypt, so we have to be compassionate. Um, we can choose to see ourselves as history's victims, perpetually vulnerable to the next Nebuchadnezzar, Caesar, Hitler, or Ahmadinejad, who seeks the destruction of the Jewish people or Jewish state. The rise of neo-Nazism and white nationalism, the increasing virulent delegitimization of Israel in the media and on college campuses, the rise in public anti-Semitism in both word and deed, all give cause for increased vigilance. When our own awareness of historic Jewish vulnerability increases our sensitivity to other present day vulnerable people, particularly immigrants and refugees who are fleeing their own Laban-like pursuers, 
And this component of Jewish identity can supply some of the energy required for us to be light in, unto the nations of the world. The analogy of the Torah's wandering Aramean to the fugitive Syrian is particularly pointed and poignant these days, although he did write this a few years ago. I would submit, however, that an overarching victim mentality is not only of limited utility, but also can backfire on us, preventing us from actualizing the fullest and most positive potential of Judaism in the world today. Can we Jews advocate for the plight of the Arabic-speaking refugee and the Spanish-speaking immigrant as willingly as we rally around Israel when rockets rain down from Gaza? Even more, can we move out of the limiting binary mindset that pre prevents us from looking out for our own as well as the other? Can we see ourselves as both fugitive and path seeker? In the final analysis, an investment in a vibrant, inclusive, justice-seeking Judaism that cares equally about today's most vulnerable populations as we do about our own people may be our best hedge against anti-Semitism and our best hope for a long and bright future for the Jewish people and the Jewish tradition.